Um, <clears throat> anyway, well, I guess we'll start over. So I do want to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I believe just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the pandemic obviously has affected our uh, ability to have in-person meetings, although we've been pleased with the number of people who have participated in our uh, Zoom meeting formats. And we've now recently expanded our field trips uh, from 10 people to 15 people. And those would be for uh, 15 vaccinated members or their guests. And it's still by reservation, which you can do on our uh, website. So we hope you will participate in that. Um, want to thank Chris Manzi and the article contributors for the newsletter every month. Uh, there's some good articles in there, a lot of new information. And uh, thank everyone else who's uh, continued to keep the website updated and the field trips filled with people and programs. And uh, we're, we're just glad you can join us. So the next upcoming field trip, and if you got in early, you saw that on the uh, on the information John was showing beforehand. It's September 11th, and it's fish seining on the Maumee, and that's in the Buttonwood area in Perrysburg. And John just put that up. And our next upcoming program will be uh, September 16th, and that's going to be Let's Talk Turtles uh, Toledo, and that will be Matt Cross from the uh, conservation biologist from the Toledo Zoo. So at this time, I believe I'm ready to introduce our speaker. And our speaker tonight uh, is from the Sandville Cranes Wetland Project and the Nature Conservancy, Alexis Sakis. And uh, she has been with the Nature Conservancy for five years and is currently the Natural Infrastructure Director and they are aiming to restore wetlands and streams throughout Ohio and with a focus on key portions of the Western Lake Erie and Ohio River basins. Their science is directing the focus in order to improve water quality. So I think without any further ado, I will uh, turn the program over to Alexis. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Can everyone hear me okay? Hopefully we are done with technical difficulties for um, the evening. And hopefully you can see my screen as well. Um, just going to go ahead and assume. Okay, yeah, cool. So um, as Barry mentioned, uh, my name is Alexis. Um, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I am quite excited by this topic. I hope to show you some some cool things um, and not bore you too much, but we'll see uh, kind of what, what you think of our project that we've got going on here. And that is what's shown in this photo here. Um, and I'm gonna talk a lot about the background and how, sort of how this project came to be. So in the beginning, it may seem like, you know, I'm off topic a little bit, but I promise I will wind around to really diving in on this project. Um, and our goals and timeline and um, all of the nitty gritty details that I'm sure you're really interested to hear. Um, I do hope you have questions and that you get something out of this. Um, and then just as Barry mentioned, I wanted to also reiterate, um, my title is Director of Natural Infrastructure for, um, I work for the Nature Conservancy here in Ohio. Um, and we have sort of ambitious goals around restoring wetlands, riparian areas, and floodplains. And so that's when I say natural infrastructure, really what I'm talking about um, is those specific habitats um, primarily. Um, a little bit about me. I, um, previous to working for TNC for the past five years, I was at University of Michigan. I did the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic. I lived in Arizona um, and worked on a trail crew for a year. So I have bounced around quite a bit, but um, have been fortunate over the past almost five years now um, to get to work on a lot of this wetland restoration type of work um, with the Peace Corps, or I'm sorry, with the Nature Conservancy. And um, so it's been really exciting and, and 
I've been thrilled to get to be involved with lots of different types of projects. So that's what I'll dive in on. I won't drone on too much about that. Um, and wanted to also just mention, as you see on the screen here, that um, this project is possible thanks to a, a combination of significant grant funds, both from Ohio, Ohio EPA, um, the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program, as well as Mommy AOC, um, which this project falls into. Um, next slide, here we go. Um, so a lot of what's driving our natural infrastructure focus or strategy is of course, um, these images that y'all are likely quite familiar with. Um, this really unacceptable situation we have on our hands here in Northwest Ohio specifically. Um, of course, Lake Erie is the most productive of the Great Lakes. While it contains just 3% of the water, it provides 50% of the fish um, over time. Super productive. And for generations, we've been able to draw water and um, pull fish from the depths of the lake. And at this point, over 7 million people live in the region. There's been extensive land conversion across this landscape, and now that's persisting, um, manifesting as persistent toxin producing algae blooms um, in the Western Basin since about the early 2000s. And it's also manifesting as hypoxia that's worsening in Lake, lake Erie's central basin in the central portion of the lake. Um, and this is all primarily as a result of non-point pollution from agriculture. Um, and, and this is all actually contributing as well to the Mississippi River Basin and hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, which these images on the right actually look quite similar to sort of what we're experiencing here in um, Lake Erie. And Gulf hypoxia covers up to 7,000 square miles. The Ohio River Basin contributes about 20%. Um, it's, it comprises 20% of that watershed of the Mississippi River Basin and 35% of the total rivers flow. So it's a significant contribution to that issue as well that, that Ohio River Basin um, contributes. And all of this has obviously resulted in significant losses in real estate, livelihoods, recreation. You all probably remember the shutdown of the city of Toledo water supply to half a million people back in 2014. We've got areas of concern um, designated for impairments to habitat wildlife and con contamination, as I mentioned. Um, the water, the Mommy AOC here locally. Oop. Are you able to hear me? Can't see the chat. Yeah, hi, is anyone having trouble hearing Alexis? Got a message that there does seem to be an issue, but doesn't look like there's anything I can do on my end. Seems fine. Okay, I'm gonna press on. Thank you. Um, there are neighbors, little kids playing next door, so maybe there's some background noise from that, but um, otherwise, um, go to my next slide here. Um, you know, much of this I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with, so this is, this is all background here. For the most part, but um, okay, it looks like it's resolved. Obviously, you know, many of us are familiar with with the um, fact that much of Northwest Ohio used to be what was called the Great Black Swamp. This was 4,800 square mile forested wetland um, that stretched into Indiana and Michigan, and the ditching and draining that took place over time was really seen as a major feat and has enabled cultivation and eliminated 95% of wetlands in the area. Um, it's now some of the most heavily tile drained land in the nation, which is quite interesting. So this is really just showing the states with the most um, tile drainage and sort of those hot spots. Um, and here in Northwest Ohio, we pops right out in that map. I will just forewarn you also right now, there are gonna be many maps throughout this presentation. <laughs> so hopefully that's of interest. Um, so 
that preference for shedding water from the landscape really does remain ingrained here in our culture. Uh, we do have an ag program at the Nature Conservancy here in Ohio, um, as well as in many other states, and there's a lot of collaboration that goes on within that program. They work with farmers directly and with crop advisors to influence at that higher level um, and increase BMP adoption and that sort of thing. But we also feel strongly that restoring natural infrastructure um, is an important piece of solving this puzzle. And the other thing about it is that it comes with important co-benefits. Um, and so we are trying to harness the increasing recognition of this problem and the recent momentum that has started to take place around changing course for a more sustainable trajectory that can benefit nature and human well-being. Um, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, Ohio, Michigan, and Ontario committed to reducing total and dissolved reactive phosphorus by 40% by 2025. And then in 19, 2019, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine created a statewide policy initiative to invest in clean and safe water for Ohio. And this is called H2 Ohio. Again, many of you I'm sure have heard of this. It's quite exciting um, what is happening with H2 Ohio at this point. Um, and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources specifically has applied their ration of these H2 Ohio funds toward um, natural infrastructure or wetland and riparian restoration. So there's all this investment happening, but we really need to be strategic and restore wetlands and riparian corridors in marginal and ag land areas. And then also make sure that we're maximizing the benefits from these investments. Um, I'm talking a lot about investments and I mentioned the, the sources of funding that we have for Sandhill Green Wetlands, which does not include H2 Ohio, but um, there are, the exciting thing is that there are these variety of um, resources and all, all told, it's, it's a lot of investment that's um, happening. But again, important to be strategic with what is ultimately limited resources. Um, as far as H2 Ohio, as well as the rest of the available funding for this type of work, the sustainability of the funds hinge on these projects being effective as well as identifying additional good projects that are really gonna get us to where we need to be in terms of meeting goals. Um, and so TNC, interestingly, has been involved in developing water funds around the world similar to HU Ohio. Um, I recently heard a project about water funds in Ecuador where they have five, and they've just demonstrated that the one in Quito that's been around for 20 years at this point, serves 2 million people, has a positive um, ROI of $2.15 for every dollar invested, 115% um, ROI. So hopefully we can get there with Ohio and that helps to keep it around for the long term. I'm hoping, um, and so I'm gonna go through some more maps, as I mentioned, to elucidate the process um, of the many things that we consider in terms of trying to target this work um, again, to just get as maximize the benefits from these projects as possible. Um, so we start by thinking about what it is that we know. And these are, you know, some of the primary rivers um, in Ohio that are, we know are carrying pollutants to our waterways. Um, This is um, a map of just obscured biodiversity hotspots. So we know where there's some areas of particular biodiversity in the state. Um, and we strive to get some overlap with places that we know we might be able to target for nutrient reduction, but also um, benefit biodiversity and try and get those win-wins. Um, we also know that um, this is a map of public land in Ohio where, you know, it might be easier to, okay, uh, it might be easier to, to actually get projects on the ground and build on corridors where we have some protected land and, um, and build those out, which is important for a variety of species. Um, certain areas of the state like Western Lake Erie, 
um, watershed there in the um, top left has far less public land than other parts of the state. Um, this is a map of land use. Um, and you can see how North, sort of the Western portion of the state's really dominated again by agriculture. And then we have sort of more forested area to the Southeast, much of, um, northern Northwest Ohio is really just productive agriculture. Um, and this is a map of just slope in Ohio. It actually quite resembles that previous map of land use where we have these really flat lands, it's conducive for agriculture. And so ultimately a variety of these factors come together into some fairly sophisticated modeling where we try to score all of Ohio to really identify where we might be able to get the most bang for our buck. So ultimately these individual locations throughout Ohio are scored based on a variety of factors, including nutrient loading, where we know there's the most loading happening based on available data, including nutrient or nitrogen, phosphorus, suspend, suspended solids, um, manure inputs, as well as soils, where there are soils that are conducive for restoring wetlands and riparian floodplains, um, where there is a lot of cultivated land on those wetland soils. And then also, again, getting back to that biodiversity, areas of biodiversity, or where we think we can get a significant lift in terms of IBI, um, index of biological integrity. Um, so we pulled together all these variety of data to try to identify where we should direct our work as much as possible. And then you also have to tie in where there's opportunity. So it isn't perfect, but um, really, again, just trying to get back to being as strategic as possible with limited resources. And I mentioned that there is a lot of good work happening. And so this is just the map. All these dots on this particular map show where there are many projects that are ongoing. Um, this is not a comprehensive picture, but it does give you a, an idea of the breadth and diversity and just geographic diversity of the projects that are, that are ongoing now, which is um, very exciting. And, um, we at TNC also have a goal to restore 1% of the Western Lake Erie Basin or the Great Black Swamp, which um, doesn't maybe sound super ambitious, but it equates to 50,000 acres, 56,000 acres to be precise. Um, we're, so again, we're really looking at where those marginal agricultural lands, primarily in the um, parts of Ohio that really sort of popped on that um, modeling map. And so this brings us to projects. Um, and I'll go ahead and dive in on this specific project that fits much of the criteria that we are after. Um, and what you see here, much of the construction of this project did take place in the winter. So, so that is what, um, that's what's depicted here. I'll get more into the construction and the specifics. Um, but this project did start many years ago. We had our eyes on this property, almost 300 acres, and it really connects a corridor in the Oak Openings region of Ohio. Of course, one of the areas that popped on that biodiversity map I showed earlier. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, it finally became possible thanks to a combination of funds. Um, and this contributes to the um, habitat beneficial use impairment in the Maumee AOC to uh, removing that beneficial use impairment. As I said, this property is shown here in pink and you can see a lot of Toledo Metro Parks land is, is yellow there um, to the north. And then Kitty, or uh, yeah, Kitty Todd, which is owned by the Nature Conservancy is shown in green. There's more Toledo Metro Parks to the south. So really what we're after here is, is building out this corridor as much as possible um, to further strengthen 
um, the important corridor through Ohio's biodiversity hotspot of the open, openings region. Um, and as a part of this project, through those same funding sources that I mentioned, we are also able to purchase an additional uh, over 30 acres. And those are shown in these, these other colors kind of sprinkled throughout the map um, to, again, just slowly uh, track by track build out this corridor. Um, so again, as I said, this, this site is almost 300 acres, a little hard to get a sense of, you know, what that 300 acres looks like, but um, we are hoping that it's what sandhill cranes need and, and that we called it that because we believe it when we build it that they will come. We're confident we're providing the right habitat at a sufficient scale here to bring these birds back to Ohio portion of the oak openings and for them to successfully nest is the hope. Restoring this property after it's been in, in agriculture for many decades will hopefully provide an opportunity to bring back all sorts of native wildlife and also provide valuable ecosystem services that you get with much of the natural infrastructure I had talked about. So that might include things like flood retention and nutrient storage that will ultimately help improve Lake Erie water quality. Um, and so again, I just want to drive the home the point that we are all, always ultimately looking to maximize the value that we can get out of any individual restoration site. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the process that we've gone through to think about how we can maximize those benefits and basically consider as much as everything under the sun as possible. And so I'm gonna start by talking about um, soil and flora, two considerations that we had in going into this um, restoration of this big farm field. Um, because TNC owns this property, we're fortunately able to sort of experiment a little bit more and take risks and learn as much as we can um, versus how we might approach a project that you know, we don't own. Um, and it's been great to be able to engage with partners, researchers, students, and volunteers. And we will continue to pursue and encourage research, research and adaptive management at the site. Um, and I'll give some examples of sort of all of the above. Um, but as I mentioned, soils are sort of a building block for a successful restoration. Um, and we, of course, have quite sandy soils here in the oak openings. On the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, you can see that in a um, soil test that we ran early on in the project, we, we showed that there were high nutrients across this site. Um, this is phosphorus in the topsoil, and every um, sample wound up with excessive phosphorus. So we knew going in there was something we would have to consider with this project. Um, another consideration was flora. Again, very important in the oak openings to consider biodiversity where we know we can um, often really get a lot of biodiversity. With this site though, we really presume there to be a pretty depleted seed bank because of this long history of agriculture. So we've um, chosen to go ahead and seed this site with a pretty dense seeding rate. We've collected um, 200 species of plants by hand through vital collaboration, again, with the Toledo Metro Parks and um, using their Blue Creek Seed Nursery, which has been invaluable for this project. Um, and going forward, many projects will undertake with a variety of project well, partners. Um, and it's important to build in resiliency at the outset with this diversity of plants that provide competition for um, invasives that always certainly come in to these restoration sites, especially on places like this where we have high nutrients in, in the soil content. Um, we've consulted with botany experts to develop lists of tolerant native plants that can withstand poor water quality and help maximize long-term maintenance. Um, in the oak openings, of course, we're taking special care with this um, project in particular. And like I said, have invested tons of time to hand collect a lot of this seed um, for a couple of years already. 
Um, I guess I lied a little bit. We're also collecting seed mechanically. And we bought the seed harvester because we do need seed at such a massive scale for this 300 acre site. And so you can see our Kitty Todd Preserve Manager running the seed harvest here, here and it really just sort of um, harvest the seed right off the top of, of these sedges here. So that has been pretty neat and very useful. Um, another consideration is the fauna, fauna and really we are aiming to benefit the diversity of fauna, like I said, looking to squeeze as much as we can out of this site, of course. So from amphibian, reptiles, macroinvertebrates, pollinators, mammals, birds, and even the microbial community. We, we consulted with a microbial ecologist who, um, you know, informed us that in the literature, they're really seeing that there's this 30 year um, rebound time frame for just the microbial community. And of course that has trickle effects across um, the, the success of your project as a whole. So really interested in her research and what she might be able to come up with in terms of trying to speed up that time frame at these really sort of altered sites that again, have just been in agriculture for so, such a long time. Of course, topography is particularly also important in your openings where even just slight variability influences your habitat community and again, contributes to that biodiversity quite significantly. Um, in this drone photo, again, we're looking at San Antonio Crane wetlands um, from the north end of the site now. Um, you can just see how flat this field is. And that's in part due to the long history of farming and heavy equipment that actually sort of smoothed the dunes out into the lower wet prairie areas and um, basically just flatten this site out like a pancake. So in restoring this site, we are referring to knowledge that we've gained through a couple of past restoration successes, which have shown that earthwork can be an effective restoration technique. One of those um, was restoring these old borrow pit ponds. Um, they were ponds that have been left over after material is harvested for other purposes, but will come in and harvest a good chunk of material. And they essentially just leave behind these holes in the ground. So we basically retrofitted these old ponds um, to have basically kind of shallower slopes as you see here on the bottom and aim to create more ephemeral type wetlands to benefit more of a variety of species. This is an example of one of one such pond you can see in the before on the top and then this was immediately post restoration of this site back in 2019 so it looks a little bit different now than it did back then but you can just see how those slopes are quite a bit shallower, um, which will benefit your turtles getting in and out and that sort of thing. So we've restored a handful of these just on Kitty Todd um, property. This, um, we've had a number of other similar successes. Um, this is Salamander Flats. Maybe some of you have been to that site. It's also just up the road on Kitty Todd Nature Preserve, where we've tested this technique to restore heterogeneity in the topography, um, as well as manage those high nutrient farm soils that are rich in organic material. Um, this site, though, was just about half an acre to one acre, um, each of these individual scrapes that you see sort of the circular uh, features on the ground there. Um, but we are seeing quite a bit of success with, with this scraping technique. And um, we're hoping that, that the benefits we're seeing there um, are benefiting endangered blue spotted salamander that we know live there. Um, we also recently saw this third reported common ringlet in Lucas County, I think this, was seen last year. And um, so as I mentioned, this technique has been seen, proven successful in numerous locations. We have another site on Kitty Todd um, that we call the pig farm, where back in, in 2000 or so, we, um, we purchased this property and it had previously been a pig farm. So it was covered in uh, residual things from pigs, as well as they were just fed bags of bread. And so there was just bags and 
crap everywhere. And so we came in and just essentially scraped the top layer off of that site. And it has exploded with um, all sorts of rare species and is one of our highest quality areas on, on Kitty Todd. Um, so with Sandhill Crane Wetlands, we are basically looking to scale that up, or we are in the midst of scaling that up on a much larger scale than we've ever done before in the oak openings. Um, so here in this, in this topo image of the topography, we're back at Sandhill where, um, yeah, just implementing it across these 280 acres. Um, you can see um, the site is really within that red line, red outline there. And um, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the areas to the west have been, had kind of that flattening effect because they've been farmed similar to Sandhill Cranes versus to the to the right, there's a lot more diversity in that topography. And so that is kind of what we're looking to mimic with the restoration. So this, this shows the proposed um, restored topography in this image within that red line. We have worked with less than ideal conditions and much of the restoration actually took place last winter. Um, this site is already quite wet. And so winter actually enabled us to get quite a bit of work done with the ground being a bit frozen. And so you can see a lot of the restoration is done by these pan loaders where they just essentially scrape a little bit of soil as they drive along and then they will carry it off to the part of the site um, to restore the topography. And so we're using these pan loaders that are in the middle of the site there, as well as the bulldozer. Hope that video doesn't make anyone too queasy. Um, and then finally, uh, the other consideration that I want to touch on that is extremely critical to, to this restoration in particular, but as well as many other projects that I work on, and that's hydrology. We know that hydrology has changed drastically in the oak openings. Um, ditching in the area has lowered the water table over time. And this has contributed to the loss of wet prairie in the oak openings. Um, this is true for Sandhill Crane Wetland. The site is spanned by two major ditches that drain this portion of the county, prairie and wiregrass. Um, they run on either side of the track. And, you know, this is also characteristic of much of Northwest Ohio. It has been drained through an extensive tile drainage network um, as I showed in that map earlier, this site is no exception. Um, there, there's tons of tile and also high capacity pumps around this site that were used to try to drain this field down in order to farm it. Um, there was also a high volume irrigation well, 260 feet down to the aquifer that was used for irrigation. So they're draining the site at certain times of year and then also irrigating. Um, and so, we are working to basically undo all of that and also in the meantime glean as much information about all of that as possible about the site and it's unrealistic that we would pull every inch of drainage tile out there we worked with um, university of toledo professor kennedy doro um, he was a new professor a couple of years ago and he was eager to come in and test the technology he uses in a variety of applications that are actually uh, far more interesting than wetland restoration called ground penetrating radar. Um, he uses it in forensic geophysics to locate mass graves, homicide victims, and buried firearms. So now he's using this technology to just detect field tile. <laughs> Not quite as exciting, but um, he was really interested in understanding its utility um, in restoration and detecting field tile. So he was able to verify over 30 miles of intact ag drainage tile um, that we're actively working to decommission across the site. And so that is shown here on the top um, right. The red lines are all of the lines that he drove. Um, this is the equipment here in the photo. Kennedy, Kennedy borrowed our ATV to pull the ground penetrating radar equipment behind him. When he doesn't have the ATV, it basically looks like a lawnmower that he just pushes across 
um, the ground and that would have taken forever to get all across the 280 acres. So he borrowed our ATV, drove his equipment back and forth for quite a while nonetheless um, across all of those red lines that are shown in that map there. And the blue dots are all positive detections that he got um, where he could in the, where he could tell that there was some type of infrastructure below ground. Um, and then in the map below was sort of a rough guesstimation of where and which direction each of those tile or infrastructure ran. So we're able to use this information in trying to decommission as much as we can of this. In further understanding the hydrology on this site, we also worked with um, Enrique Gomez del Campo, who's at Bowling Green. Uh, he had extensively modeled the larger watershed and the ditches that span the site, but we really needed site-specific information to um, try to anticipate where we would have pooling on site when all of this infra hydrologic infrastructure got yanked. Um, and we know that there are particularly complex interactions of surface and groundwater in the openings. So we had a hydrologist develop a integrated surface water groundwater flow model. Um, again, so we would have better expectations around where we would have cooling. Um, and ultimately we're trying to get at these goals of restoring stormwater storage capacity, um, which we came up with a really rough estimate, but likely somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 million gallons or 900 acre feet um, of water that will be able to hold on site. And this will enable groundwater recharge. Um, and this is a <clears throat> snapshot of a wet April, kind of also helpful in determining ideal scrape depths. So when we're coming in and scraping these wetland areas a little bit deeper, um, it's important to know what depths we're going to. We're really not looking to, you know, restore those, those ponds that we had to retrofit on Kitty Top, but more vernal pool type of habitat and aim for appropriate wet prairie hydro periods, um, pool depths that benefit amphibians, all of those types of things. So it can be quite complex. Finally, this is just a quick fact sheet that we are putting together um, for. I think I've pretty much mentioned most, most of these little factoids, but kind of a cutesy fact sheet um, with some additional information about, about the project and what we're able to pull off there. Um, and then something else that I know um, TNA mentioned that they were interested in was also just sort of an update on the status and timeline of this project. So this is a recent picture just from the past few weeks. Um, a lot more construction has finally taken place since last winter. Um, this spring, though it was quite dry, uh, this site, before we've done anything, really wanted to be wetlands already. We delineated about 80% of the site to be wetlands, and so we're really just looking to enhance that. And um, so though spring was quite dry, we still really were not able to have heavy equipment out there on site. And then July and August have remained quite wet. Um, so it has been a struggle and construction has been quite a bit less efficient than, than we would hope for. But um, we're finally sort of winding down and a lot of the construction should basically be finished up over the course of the next few weeks. At that time, we will come in in September um, and seed those 200 species of native seed that we have. We actually have two mixes um, that we'll be putting down. We're working with a farmer to seed the site, to actually drill it in. We're going to be borrowing a um, native seed drill from Toledo Metro Parks um, to actually drill that seed into the site where we tend to have a little more success um, with the success of that seeding. Um, and then there are certain species that you kind of have to hand seed, they don't do as well in the drill. So we'll be doing a combination of both of those here just in the next month or two. Um, and we are also working on small access area 
um, which will be right off of Angola Road. So just a short trail, a little bit of signage and planting a handful of trees. We don't wanna to go too crazy planting a bunch of trees um, because we have run into issues in the past where we have invasives coming up again in these high nutrient soils and wind up um, losing your trees due to overspray and that sort of thing. So we have funding to maintain this project quite aggressively for the next four years. And um, we will, of course, maintain it in perpetuity, but we're fortunate to have very solid funding um, through the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program um, to really make sure it's resilient in that um, sort of initial couple of years of the project. Um, so it will be accessible to birders and nature enthusiasts. We hope you come out and sort of watch as this restoration continues to unfold. It's just bound to get more exciting from here, um, but we are seeing some pretty cool species even just popping up um, this past year while things were still kind of under construction and certainly not what we're hope they'll be in the next few years. Um, so quite promising and um, just goes to show how much we need additional green space in Northwest Ohio. So that is all I have. I really, again, appreciate your time and interest in our project. Feel free to you know, reach out to me anytime at this information here. This is Irwin Prairie State Nature Preserve, you might recognize. And um, of course, I don't even know that I mentioned, but Sandhill Crane Wetland would have been part of this historic Irwin Prairie um, complex, though it's, you know, quite a distance up the road. Um, it would have all been one contiguous wetland back in the day. So certainly aiming for something somewhere along the lines of what you see at um, Irwin Prairie. So with that, I can take any questions. Okay, you have a few in the chat window if you take a look. So we have not gotten feedback from folks at the airport um, about trying to attract these large birds so close to them. Um, it's a good question. <laughs> but I have not actually spoken with anyone at the airport, so I don't know how they would feel about, about it. Um, Sandhill cranes are quite prolific, even just over the border in Michigan. Um, and I'm not aware of major problems, but cer certainly something to consider and it's a good question. Um, as far as people that we have for the hand seating, we would love to engage volunteers uh, for that activity. This being such a large site, I think we also may um, basically set up our UTVs where we would have somebody driving the UTV and maybe somebody sort of seating off of the back just because it's going to be quite a, a lift to puff it across this site. Um, I hope many of you have maybe <clears throat> already been out there, but if you haven't, please come out and check it out. And it's really hard to get a feel for how big this site really is without having seen it in person. Um, so please come out and, and check it out. Um, and let me know at this contact information here if you wanna volunteer. Um, As far as how folks might hear about the status of a given restoration, um, this question is a little bit ambiguous about um, whether milestones have been met. Um, but if you have questions about a specific project or this project in particular, certainly feel free to give me a call anytime. There are a variety of techniques to deal with excessive phosphorus on the site to prevent it from leaching off, running off or leaching. Um, this is a really good question. And, you know, moving forward, hoping to restore more of these marginal um, agriculture lands that will continue to be a question and something we have to contend with. Um, and certainly something we are not, you know, looking to see. There are ways to get at this, even just by um, farming the site and then um, removing that 
biomass, the material, the you know soybeans would work. Um, that can help to start to deplete the soil, and that also sets you up for a good um, restoration in terms of there not being a lot of weeds established. So that's one of the best ways um, to prep a site for a restoration. And then there are other cover crops you can incorporate in to, to further um, restore the soils. Um, so that's certainly something to think about when your timeline allows. Um, so there are a variety of, you know, you start to get into lots of ag BMPs and lots of things that you can consider. Um, we have somebody, Paul mentioned that the water pools in the western end of the site became famous with bird watchers in 2016. There was a curly sandpiper out there. I think this was during the biggest week in American birding. Um, and many kinds of shorebirds and waterfowl fowl, um, continue to visit the site every year. Um, so Rab Road is a nice access point because it's not quite as busy as Angola Road. Um, and so feel free to certainly stop along there. Um, and I talked a lot about trying to sort of maximize the benefits that we can get from this site. We were, we are still in the mid, we have construction going on, you know, today. Um, that continues. And so, unfortunately, because of that, we've had to continue to draw water down from the site um, this year, especially more than any other year. So we do actually still have the pumps running just to draw water off of the site to facilitate that construction for the eventual, you know, for that all to be removed as of the end of this year. All of the restoration, the major earthwork will be done um, like I said, over the next month, and um, and then we will let the, the site flood like it naturally would. Um, and we are looking to sort of maximize the, the variety of habitats that we can get across this site. So certainly aiming for extensive wet prairie as well as some uh, oak savanna and sand barrens will be the three primary communities that we will aim to restore there. We don't have like live updates about the project on a website, but it's not a bad idea. We do sometimes advertise things like that through our social media content. Um, so that might be the closest thing for sort of more live updates. If you have thoughts or would like to see more of that, um, you know, shoot me an email and I love that kind of feedback. So if there's specific content that would be of interest, um, we will definitely take that into consideration. <clears throat> Hi, if uh, any folks wanna unmute themselves to uh, ask a question um, more naturally, go ahead and do that too. These are some really good questions in the chat. I love this. Um, Sandhill cranes do already seem to be increasing. Um, and actually they were chosen, the name was chosen before I really led the project. And I think it was just, um, you know, we debated, a, I believe that there were a few options debated, but um, they haven't nested specifically in the Ohio portion of the oak openings. Um, and so the thought was, because this site is, is just as large as it is, again, it's hard to really grasp that 280 acres, what that looks like and feels like unless you've been out there. So again, come on out. But um, really, I think it was the scale of this project that's sort of um, prompted the name to some degree and a specific habitat that we hope to restore there. <clears throat> Paul again asked, as an H2O Ohio project, can you talk about the design process and any targets for phosphorus removal? How many um, tons per year 
will be for, prevented from going into Lake Erie? How is it measured and modeled or calculated? Um, though I did harp about ACE to Ohio because that is kind of what all of the buzz is about and it's very exciting for Ohio. This project is actually not funded by ACE to Ohio. It is um, by Great Lakes Restoration Initiative through the Maumee Area of Concern. And then um, we also have funding through the Water Resource Restoration Sponsor Program, WRRSP. So it's those combinations of funding that, they, that made this specific project possible. Um, but, <clears throat> and through the Maumee AOC, what that program is really driving to support is, is habitat as um, it pertains to this particular project. They try to improve um, the benefit, the, specific impairments within um, the watershed. And so there will be a variety of impairments, habitat being one of them, and that's what this project specifically applied to. Um, with these two Ohio projects in general, which um, I do have a few other projects funded through H2O Ohio, there is sort of a couple of ways that they get at this question of phosphorus removal. That tends to be very project specific. Um, there are some sort of models that do help get at that estimate. Um, and it is calculated for every project, but it does vary a little bit sort of project to project. Um, I can't say that we estimated tons per year for this for Santo Cranes specifically, because again, that was a little bit of a different focus the funding source for this particular project. So I'm not sure if that specifically addressed your question, but if you want to talk offline about that in a bit more detail, we could do that as well, Paul. All right. Um, I think we've gotten a lot of questions. Uh, Alexis, you gave a lot of information, not just about uh, the Sand Hill Crane Project, but Ohio in general. And I think uh, from some of the comments I saw, um, people learned a lot and appreciated it. So we want to thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, maybe we can have you back in a few years to show us the final project and how we're doing. And we will get out there to see it. I, I will guarantee you a number of these people uh, go by that area frequently and uh, they'll be out there seeing the entire 288 acres. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much again for your time. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for being here tonight and uh, would remind you that September 16th uh, will be our next program. Let's talk Turtles Toledo with Matt Cross. And uh, we have the uh, upcoming field trip on September 11th with Jim Witter and Bill Hufflin on uh, the uh, uh, fish sailing on the mommy. So I think with that, we are ready to adjourn and I appreciate everyone, appreciate everyone for being here. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.